our thoughts could make us sick. So if it's possible that our thoughts could make us sick, is it possible that our thoughts could make us well? People wake up in the morning, uh, they begin to think about their problems. Those problems are circuits of memories in the brain. Each one of those memories are connected to people and things at certain times and places. And if the brain is a record of the past, the moment they start their day, they're already thinking in the past. Each one of those memories has an emotion. Emotions are the end product of past experiences. So the moment they recall those memories of their problems, they all of a sudden feel unhappy, they feel sad, they feel pain. Now, how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. So the person's entire state of being when they start their day is in the past. So what does that mean? The familiar past will sooner or later be predictable future. So if you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny and you can't think greater than how you feel, or feelings have become the means of thinking, by very definition of emotions, you're thinking in the past. And for the most part, you're gonna keep creating the same life. So then people grab their cell phone, they check their WhatsApp, they check their texts, they check their emails, they check Facebook, they take a picture of their feet, they post it on Facebook, they tweet something, they do Instagram, uh, they check the news, and now they feel really connected to everything that's known in their life. And then they go through a series of routine behaviors. They get out of bed on the same side, they go to the toilet, they get a cup of coffee, they take a shower, they get dressed, they drive to work the same way, they do the same things, they see the same people, they push the same emotional buttons, and that becomes the routine and it becomes like a program. So now they've lost their free will to a program and there's no unseen hand doing it to them. So when it comes time to change, the re redundancy of that cycle becomes a subconscious program. Now, 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old is a memorized set of behaviors, emotional reactions, unconscious habits, hardwired attitudes, beliefs, and perceptions that function like a computer program. So then a person can say with their 5% of their conscious mind, I want to be healthy, I want to be happy, I want to be free. But the body is on a whole different program. So then how do you begin to make those changes? Well, you have to get beyond the analytical mind because what separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind is the analytical mind. And that's where meditation comes in because you can teach people to practice how to change their brainwaves, slow them down. And when they do that properly, they do enter the operating system where they can begin to make some really important changes. So um, most people then wait for crisis or trauma or disease or diagnosis, you know, they wait for loss, uh, some tragedy to make up their mind to change. And my message is why wait? And, and you can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering or you can learn and change in a state of joy and inspiration. And I think right now, the cool thing is that people are waking up what is that? Why do people find it so hard to get past trauma? Well, <clears throat> the, the stronger the emotional reaction you have to some experience in your life, the higher the emotional quotient, the more you pay attention to the cause. And the moment the brain puts all of its attention on the cause, it takes a snapshot, and that's called a memory. So long-term memories are created from very highly emotional experiences. So what happens then is that people think neurologically within the circuitry of that experience and they feel chemically within the boundaries of those emotions. And so when you have an emotional reaction to someone or something, most people think that they can't control their emotional reaction. Well, it turns out if you allow that emotional reaction, it's called a refractory period, to last for hours or days, that's called a mood. You say to someone, hey, well, what's up? You say, I'm in a mood. Well, why are you in a mood? Well, I had this thing happen to me five days ago and I'm having one long emotional reaction. If you keep that same emotional reaction going on for weeks or months, that's called temperament. Why is he so bitter? I don't know, let's ask him. Why is he so bitter? Why are you bitter? Well, I had this thing happen to me nine months ago. And if you keep that same emotional reaction going on for years on end, that's called a personality trait. And so learning how to shorten your refractory period of emotional reactions is really where the, where the work starts. So then people, when they have an event, what they do is they keep recalling the event because the, the emotions of stress hormones, the survival emotions, are saying pay attention to what happened because you want to be prepared if it happens again. 
Turns out most people spend 70% of their life living in survival and living in stress. So they're, they're always anticipating the worst case scenario based on a past experience. And they're literally, out of the infinite potentials in the quantum field, they're selecting the worst possible outcome and they're beginning to emotionally embrace it with fear. And they're conditioning their body into a state of fear. Do that enough times, the body has a panic attack without you. you. You can't even predict it because it's programmed subconsciously. The emotions from the experience tend to give the body and the brain a rush of energy. So people become addicted to the rush of those emotions and they use the problems and conditions in their life to reaffirm their limitation so at least they can feel something. So now when it comes time to change, you say to the person, why are you this way? Well, every time they recall the event, they're producing the same chemistry in their brain and body as if the event is occurring. Firing and wiring the same circuits and sending the same emotional signature to the body. Well, what's the relevance behind that? Well, your body is the unconscious mind. It doesn't know the difference between the experience that's creating the emotion and the emotion that you're creating by thought alone. So the body's believing it's living in the same past experience 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And so then when those emotions influence certain thoughts, and they do, and then those thoughts create the same emotions, and those same emotions influence the same thoughts, now the entire person's uh, state of being is in the past. So then the hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before, period. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, get ready because it's going to feel uncomfortable. In a sense, if you're sitting down and you start thinking about uh, some future worst case scenario that you're conjuring up in your mind, and you begin to feel the emotion of that event, your body doesn't know the difference between the event that's taking place in your world, outer world, and what you're creating by emotion or thought alone. So most people then, they're, they're constantly reaffirming their emotional states. So when it comes time to give up that emotion, they can say, I really want to do it. But really the body is stronger than the mind because it's been conditioned that way. So the servant now has become the master. And the person all of a sudden, once they step into that unknown, they'd rather feel guilt and suffering because at least they can predict it. Being the unknown, is a scary place for most people because the unknown is uncertain. And people say to me, well, I can't predict my future. I'm in the unknown and I always say the best way to predict your future is to create it. Not from the known, but from the unknown. What thoughts do you want to fire and wire in your brain? What behaviors do you want to demonstrate in one day? The act of rehearsing them mentally, closing your eyes and rehearsing the action. The rehearsing the reaction of what you want? or the Yeah, action the action of what you want by closing your eyes and mentally rehearsing some action. If you're truly present, the brain does not know the difference between what you're imaging and what you're experiencing in 3D world. So then you begin to install the neurological hardware in your brain to look like the event has already occurred. Now, your brain is no longer a record of the past. Now it's a map to the future. And if you keep doing it, priming it that way, the hardware becomes a software program. And who knows, you just may start acting like a happy person. And then I think the, the hardest part is to teach our body emotionally what the future will feel like ahead of the actual experience. So what does that mean? You can't wait for your success to feel empowered. You can't wait for your wealth to feel abundant. You can't wait for your, your new relationship to feel love or uh, uh, your healing to feel whole. I mean, that's the old model of reality of cause and effect, you know, waiting for something outside of us to change how we feel inside of us. And when we feel better inside of us, we pay attention to whoever or whatever caused it. But what that means then is that from the Newtonian world is that most people spend their whole life living in lack, waiting for something to change out there. What do you mean the Newtonian world? The Newtonian world is all about the predictable. It's all about predicting a future. But the quantum model of reality is, is about causing an effect. The moment you start feeling abundant and worthy, you are generating wealth. The moment you're empowered and feel it, you're beginning to step towards your success. The moment you start feeling whole, your healing begins. And when you love yourself and you love all of life, you'll create an equal. And now you're causing an effect. And I think that's the, the difference between living as a victim 
in your world saying, I am this way because of this person or that thing or this experience. They made me think and feel this way. When you switch that around, you become a creator of your world and you start saying, my thinking and my feeling is changing an outcome in my life. And now that's a whole different game and we start believing more that we're creators of reality. And most people, uh, when they have a thought, they just think that that's the truth. And I think one of my greatest realizations in my own journey was just because you have a thought doesn't necessarily mean it's true. So if you think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day, and we do, and 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before, and you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, your life's not gonna change very much because the same thought leads to the same choice, the same choice leads to the same behavior, the same behavior creates the same experience, and the same experience produces the same emotion. And so then, the act of becoming conscious of this process to, to begin to become more aware of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. It's called metacognition. And so then, why is that important? Because the more conscious you become of those unconscious states of mind and body, the less likely you're gonna go unconscious during the day. And that thought is not gonna slip by your awareness unchecked because you're, it means to know thyself. And the word meditation means to become familiar with. So as you become familiar with the thoughts, the behaviors, and the emotions of the old self, you're retiring that old self. As you fire and wire new thoughts and condition the body into a new emotional state, if you do that enough times, it'll begin to become familiar to you. So to change then is to be greater than your environment, to be greater than the conditions in your world, and the environment is that seductive. So then, why is meditation the tool? Well, let's sit down, let's close our eyes. Let's disconnect from your outer environment. So if you're seeing less things, there's less stimulation going to your brain. If you're playing soft music or you have earplugs in, less sensory information coming to your brain. So you're disconnecting from your environment. If you can sit your body down and tell it to stay like an animal, stay right here. I'm gonna feed you when we're done. You can get up and check your emails. You can do all your texts, but right now, you're gonna sit there and obey me. When you do that properly, and the, you're not eating anything, or smelling anything, or tasting anything, you're not up experiencing and feeling anything, you would have to agree with me that you're being defined by a thought, right? So when the body wants to go back to its emotional past, and you become aware that your attention is on that emotion, and where you place your attention is where you place your energy, you're siphoning your energy out of the present moment into the past, and you become aware of that, and you settle your body back down in the present moment because it's saying, well, it's eight o'clock, you normally get upset because you're in traffic around this time, and here you are sitting and we're used to feeling anger and you're off schedule. Oh, it's 11 o'clock and you usually check your emails and judge everybody. Well, the body's looking for that, that predictable chemical state. Every time you become aware that you're doing that and your body is craving those emotions and you settle it back down into the present moment, you're telling the body it's no longer the mind, that you're the mind. And now your will is getting greater than the program. And if you keep doing this over and over again, over and over again, over and over again, when the body's no longer the mind, when it finally surrenders, there's a liberation of energy.